Okay, welcome everybody to episode two of Happiness in Humans, the reboot of HR and your PJs. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces again, um, but there are a couple new ones. So I think it'd be useful again, just to go through um, introductions, kick off with that. Um, and I'll start with Caroline. Rosie, you always start with me. I know. Well, you're the first. The first the <laughs> I'm going down that. Oh, you changed my mind, man. Uh, so I'm Caroline. I work at the Happiness Index with Rosie, um, mainly on our events and thought leadership. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and Claire. Hi everyone, um, I'm Claire. So I work at Career Pass Network, which is a graduate careers platform. I'm Chief People Officer there, which involves pretty much everything to do with people and probably like everything else on top of that. So pretty busy role. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Uh, Emma, good to see you again. I can skip past you for having lunch. <laughs> I can still talk. <laughs> that was good at multitasking, so I guess. Um, I'm Emma Rose. I am. Um, I've always been consultancy side on the um, culture and experience space, and I'm currently working on a rather interesting um, M and A cultural audit, which is proving very interesting. Ooh. It'd be interesting to hear more about that sometime. Yeah, 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 for sure. At the minute, I am heads down, and it is, you know, when you find really, really interesting insights, and you're like, ooh, I can't wait to speak to people about this. <laughs> I'm at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free to share that in the Happiness and Humans community. Um, if anybody's not a part of it, I'll post, post a link in the chat. Um, thanks, Emma. Um, Fiorenza, how are you? Hi. Hi, Rosie. Hi, everyone. Hi. Are we doing intros? Is that what we're doing? Yes, we're doing intros again. And there's some new faces on here. So, Right. Of course. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Fiorenza. Um, I run Generation Mindful. I uh, partner with organizations to create um, and implement well-being and professional development program. So what I specialize in is mindfulness, leadership coaching, and cross-cultural communication. Great, thank you. Um, hi, Camilla, we uh, are just doing introductions. Welcome to Happiness in Humans. If you'd like to do an introduction of yourself, feel free to. Hi, everyone, not sure if you can hear me. I'm Camilla, I work at checkout.com. I'm a senior culture specialist. I'm really sorry I missed the rest of the intro, so I'm not sure what else you're sharing. No worries, we just started off. Um, we're just doing quick introductions of each other um, just to get to know who's on the call. But thanks. Um, who am I on now? Heidi. Hello, I'm, I'm Heidi Asbury. I'm the head of HR at a company called Vacovo. I'm head of happiness is just another name for the head of HR, um, but with a more happy twist. So yes, hello everybody. <laughs> Good to see you. you too. Are you on a, on a daily walk? Well, I'm just, um, I'm getting my house rewired. So I'm working at my friend's house. I just went home to get some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and some sunshine. Yeah. Well, it's not that sunny in Oxford, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Um, Jenny. No problem. Hi, so I'm Jenny. I'm CEO and founder of Nutcracker Agency, which is a sales and marketing agency. And I'm very excited to be a guest on today's episode. Thanks, Jenny. And Jenny Workman. Hey. Um, hello, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, Jenny Workman. I work at Arup. I'm the Global People Consultation Program Manager. Yay! I remember my job title. <laughs> Essentially, I work in the people um, team. Thanks, Rosie. Thank you. <laughs> um, who are we on now? Joe. Joe Wedwood. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe. I also work at the Happiness Index. I'm the chief storyteller. So I'm a fancy way of saying I do all the content marketing and branding and design, all the coloring in basically. Thanks, Joe. Um, Jordan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jordan and I work with Jenny at Nutcracker Agency. 
Right. Nice to meet you, Jordan. Welcome to Happiness in Humans. Um, Kevin, you're up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin from Williams Kent. Uh, I'm the founder, but we're a small business, so I'm in charge of happiness culture. So, hence why I'm here. <laughs> Kevin. Um, I'll skip past Lucy. She's having her lunch. Um, Margarita. Hi, yeah, I'm back. Constantly kicked out. <laughs> yeah, Margarita, Chief Happy Fire. That's my title, if you want to talk about titles. And I'm owner of Calm and Curious. So I work with organizations, also with individual people and with the community to basically spread happiness and uh, with different messaging, depending on who I'm talking to. But that's, but that's the essence. And as an ex-product manager, also very much interested in good technology, which helps us to thrive and to become happier. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Maria. Did you say Maria? Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, okay. It went wobbly. Hi, I'm Maria Riley. Um, I'm an independent HR consultant, um, Acorns and Oaks. Um, I work with small business primarily, those that don't need all of these huge um, HR departments or people happiness departments. Um, so, yeah, I help them just to manage their people. Thanks, Maria. Yeah. Um, Mark. Hi everyone, Mark from Apple's Index. It's nice to see some familiar faces and new faces. Looking forward to today's session. Thanks, Mark. Um, Rachel. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Stevenson. I work for a company called Brookson Limited um, in Warrington in Cheshire. Um, I'm an HR business partner, so it's quite a generalist role. We're quite a small HR department, but we've got, um, following all the COVID, the remote working, people being at home, um, we've got a project coming up that's to focus on our culture and our people. So, um, Hence why joining the, um, the call today, just to perhaps get a few ideas. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, and last but not least, Tito. Um, yes, like hi everyone. Yeah, of course. Hi everyone. I'm Tito. I am a people culture specialist at a company called uh, Checkout.com, um, and I look after employee engagement and recognition. All right. Thank you. Um, and that's everybody. So um, I'm just going to put the link to Happiness and Humans community. Um, it's on Slack. It's just in the chat here. So if you're not already part of it, please feel free to join. Um, and then I also want to start off with a few stats from our employee voice data. So for those of you who don't know, we um, have launched a survey tool called Employee Voice. It's free for a six months trial if you'd like to try it out. Um, it's just a safe place for your people to share their anonymous feedback 24-7 um, whenever they'd like, um, just about how they're feeling um, and themes that we typically see around like work-life work balance, um, the weather especially is having a bit, big effect on our moods um, and um, yeah, just a safe place for your people to share feedback. Um, but some stats that we've pulled, well, Caroline's pulled from, from, for us recently. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so the happiness average score is down. So in September, it dropped to 5.8. But in the last seven days, um, it's dropped to 5.6, most likely due to the fact that we just had that um, unfortunate announcement a couple of days about the next six months to look forward to. Um, and then the percent favorable is also down um, from 53% in August to 49% in September. Um, and then lastly, the average sentiment from the comments um, is down from 0.13 in July to 0.08 in September. So unfortunately, it's looking not so positive. But as we all know, I mean, community is really important right now and we're all in this together. So hopefully we can all kind of help each other find ways to boost up our happiness. Um, but today I've got Ben on from Nutcracker. She did an introduction of herself earlier um, as our guest star. And we're just going to chat about how she has worked to create a thriving culture in uh, Nutcracker. So thanks Jenny for ju jumping on today. Um, my first question for you is, in your opinion, this can be different for many other people, um, but in your opinion specifically, what would you consider to be a thriving working environment? So I think for me, a thriving working environment, I mean, there's lots of telltale signs, whether it's thriving from the obvious kind of 
you know, whether people have sick days, whether they're late, you know, kind of general engagement for for work from that perspective. But for me, a thriving culture is very much if people understand what their objectives are, what what, what they're trying to achieve. Um, and I think you can tell a thriving culture from from personality, from engagement, just from how people are interacting together. So I think when 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 cultures are thriving, I, lots of ideas are coming up with deadlines are being met, people are supporting each other, there's interactions. Um, and I think that often I've noticed with different teams, obviously it's different with Nutcracker because it's my own business, but previously running different teams, you can tell a lot by just people's um, personas when they walk in, you know, just the general interactions, just whether people are keeping their heads down, whether they're engaging. Um, so for me, a thriving culture is one where all different personality types um, feel able to be heard and engaged and be part of it, but also understand what they need to achieve. So I think that can often be overlooked. I think people can often underestimate that people can't really thrive unless they understand what they're contributing. Mm. I love that. Thank you. Um, also, by the way, if anybody would like to get involved in the conversation, feel free to um, get involved at any point um, or ask questions as well. Um, so how, how would you facilitate um, an open feedback culture. I think that's really important to also have a thriving culture. And we've had conversations around this, but I think yeah. you've got good insight into it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. I think having meaningful conversations is actually very difficult. I think, you know, as, as how, how we relate to each other, people often are quite guarded, don't feel able to be honest or worried about how they're perceived. And I think that can really hinder having open conversations. At Nutcracker, it, for me the steer is very much let's be honest let's have a meaningful conversation because actually the truth is actually really great if we're all pretending something and not meaning it then we can't achieve anything so I think that that's facilitating conversations where people would rather not have them because they're awkward you know I think there are conversations where you naturally want to shy away from them because it's not as happy as wow great work like actually it's quite awkward to say oh you two seem to be having tension what's the problem well, that's that's quite an awkward conversation to facilitate but mm -hmm. actually, to have a true open culture where people can thrive and fulfill their potential you need to be able to facilitate those difficult conversations and I think that's hard to get right but the only way to do it in my opinion is by taking the time to explain why it matters and why it's important and then I think people relax and think well wow, this is great I can actually have a voice and I, then I think mm -hmm. you can shift that but I think it does take educating to change the, the mindset of I'm not normally allowed to do this or this isn't how it's been previously or I'm not sure I should be saying this or I don't want to hurt someone's feelings or it's really for me it's about approaching work as a grown-up environment where you know it's okay to give constructive feedback and it's okay mm -hmm. to receive constructive feedback it doesn't mean someone hates you or that you're terrible at your job it's actually really useful so I think it's how you perceive those difficult conversations I think part of that perception is educating people on that yeah do you think that it's um easier to have op more open conversations while we're working remotely or do you think it's more difficult I, th I think it's been it's easier now but I think it was harder because I think when when COVID, the lockdown was first announced, there was so much pressure on organisations which just trying to adapt that that real human element, I think, was sidelined a little bit because actually it was firefighting. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think once the lockdown took, you know, took hold, actually those those kind of real human conversations around how are you, how are you coping, actually became fundamental to you know productivity success to making sure that people were coping okay mm -hmm. so i think where where kind of online interaction has become second nature through habits yeah. i kind of find them both as easy as each other but certainly it was it took a while to adapt because we were used to having difficult conversations face to face where you can read body language you can kind of you know and to an extent if there really is a truly difficult conversation i would still rather do it face to face because i think it's much easier to give that yeah, that, that security to that person that is going to find it difficult if you're physically there yeah yeah definitely I think also like I mean as we all know we're all in this together and we're all kind of feeling um like the stress of the uncertainty and everything and I think it's easier to show your true emotions and who you really are when you're under that pressure under that stress and you know that that we're all in, like it's like com camaraderie almost in this so yeah I think definitely it's been easier for me as um personally to have and be more open and honest with my conversations and um yeah truly be myself i guess but um my next question for you um 
where where does a thriving culture start is it bottom down wait top down bottom up <laughs> yeah i think it's just it's a real tricky one because at nutcracker i've trialed lots of different approaches of child you know kind of a, a, a flat culture uh almost one person's top and everyone underneath to lots of different you know i've tried lots of different approaches and actually i think i think it has to be led by the top i think it has to be led because you know, Nutcracker, for example, there is zero tolerance for kind of a toxic environment at all. So, you know, you should be able to leave the room and not be spoken about. You know, there's basic fundamental things. And I, and I can lead that by making sure that if somebody were to come with me with something which wasn't directly to the person they worked with, I can then say, this is not the right way to do it. You need to go direct. You know, like, so I can facilitate that type of, to, to show that that's not the way to behave. Um, also, you know, by my own leading by example, by me, by me accepting if I make a mistake, by me willing to have a difficult conversation that I find uncomfortable, or just by just by putting my money where my mouth is, really, and actually mm -hmm. making sure that I'm walking the walk that I'm asking other people to walk, I think makes it much easier to cement that culture. I think mm -hmm. it's very difficult for me to say, right, we're all going to have difficult conversations, but I'm never going to have a difficult conversation. You know, like that that doesn't really work. So yeah. I think it has to be led by the top. Having said that, for it to be truly successful, every, everybody on the team needs to understand what that is and then needs to like be able to express if they find it uncomfortable, if they need support or how they feel about it. So I think it has to be a, a team effort, but I think you have to very much give clear steer in terms of what that culture looks like so that people mm -hmm. understand. Yep. Yeah, definitely agreed. Um, I guess that Can I ask a question? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering what sort of support do you give to people to enable them to speak up? So I think at Nutcracker it's very much it's very much one what well, it's very much kind of as and when it's needed. So I personally don't necessarily believe in kind of really set formats where you'll speak to people every three months. Like it's not really like that at Nutcracker. It's very engaged, it's very interactive. So it depends on the situation, it depends on how it's handled. If I know that somebody, because I know my team really well, like I really do understand their emotional drivers and, you know, their hurdles and their pain points within, you know, situations they find difficult. So if I know that somebody is going to have a personal challenge for them, then I might well coach them before it so that they can handle it themselves so that they're growing in confidence. If it's something which I feel needs to be a development for a manager in a, a manager situation, then again, I'll coach. But if I feel that it's going to benefit the team to actually just have it there and there, then I will do it. I will, I will probably lead it and then just bring people in and set the tone and then get their opinion. So I think it's very much a one size doesn't fit all. It really depends on what, on what it is. And, you know, I've, I'm extremely lucky in the sense that I can you know, I can really control who works at Nutcracker in the sense that I haven't got to um, a big board or, you know, it's my business. So I have that advantage in the sense that the people that I employ to work at Nutcracker are genuinely people that I really like. Um, and I think if you've got people that have got that, if you know that people are acting with the right intentions, that they're, they are hardworking, they want it to work, they've got the right attitude, then pretty much everything you can overcome because you know that their their drivers are right. I think it's far more difficult you know, and I have had people that have needed to be managed. I'm not saying it's always been utopia and we've always skipped through butterflies. There's been lots of difficult situations. But I think what I've learned is that you need to really make sure that everyone's on the same page to be able to have a really thriving culture anyway. So as long as you've got that and everyone's on the same page, it's easier to kind of work out by situation what level of support is needed to facilitate, you know, difficult conversations or conversations that are needed for culture to thrive. All right, cool. Thank you. It's a great question, Heidi. Thanks um okay so this question i actually stole from matt Phelan. <laughs> we used to run breakfast um back i don't know it seems like years ago um last year um where we kind of do something similar to this and have conversations around different topics such as thriving culture um but one of the questions that he really liked and i think you might like this jenny is how do you do you think that brand and culture are the same thing you is know, there a link between them? it's a real tricky one that i mean for me it's kind of a bit chicken and egg you can't really have one without the other Having said that, I think your brand does reflect, reflect your culture. So with Nutcracker, um, for me, you know, there's, there's lots and lots of marketing agencies out there. You know, how does Nutcracker stand out? Why is it different? Why does it win awards or the rest of it? And I think that's because we approach things differently. So to be able to approach things differently, you need to put the effort in to create a, an environment where people can be creative. You know, you need to make sure people understand 
how critical certain attention to detail is, certain strategic thinking, certain ways of working. And that culture then dictates that the brand holds true to its values. So I think while they're interlinked, there's no good saying my brand is this if your culture doesn't enable that brand to happen. So I think for me, it's very much about culture and brand being aligned, but I think you need to have clear parameters in what your culture is in order to achieve it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, thank you, that was a great answer. <laughs> um, so um, now, now that you've spoken about how you've created your thriving culture, how do you maintain that, especially while remote working? You know, it can feel tough. You can feel like you've just put out a fire in one area and then another one pops up somewhere else. And it can feel, you know, let's face it, you know, managing people is difficult and, you know, it's tough. And, you can, you know, you can. And I think when when you're part of a team and you haven't necessarily had the experience of the buck stopping with you, you're not aware of the impact you're having on those around you. And I think that can be quite difficult to try and educate people on. You know, we all have bad days, but actually your bad day has now had a little dominoes effect and it's it's really stressful. So I think it's it's constant, it's, it's not thinking it's done or you've won or it's completed or you've achieved it because whenever you have that moment where you think, oh, I'm doing all right at this, then something else props up and you have to really challenge yourself to address it properly. So mm -hmm. for me, I think it's being fluid and it's, it's really making sure that you really are, you know, but whether you've got a large team and you've got managers looking after different teams, whether you've, you know, you've got one-on-one -on -one access to people, I think it's making sure that you really are regularly talking to people so you can try and preempt stuff before it gets to a crisis point. But in answer to your question of maintaining it, I think it is a constant evolving um, area where you need to, you know, what works now may not work in a month's time. You need to be able to evolve with what's happening, with the stage your team are at, you know, with whatever challenge they are. And I think you need to be sensitive. You know, you mentioned earlier work-life balance. One of our clients looks at a work-life blend, and it's 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 really changed how I see the the role of work plays in people's lives. So it really is very much part of a blend. You don't almost stop having a life when you walk into work and then pick up your life. You know, kind of it's all part and parcel of that mix. And I think if you can understand that then it's easier to see your team as humans, you know, with actual, their own challenges, their own fears, their own insecurities, their own issues that can be blockers for their success. And I think that's where you have to really take the time to get to know people and understand that the reason why they don't want to stand up is because they were laughed at when they were six or something. You know, if you can understand where things come from, then you can really help facilitate lasting change. And then it's easier to maintain a thriving culture because you know, mm -hmm. people are changing for longer term rather than just for that awkward conversation. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you too. And like that, just being self-aware and that's where empathy comes in too. And just understanding like how you're affecting other people. We kind of touched on that last week with empathy. And I just think it's so, it's a really important thing I to it's really have. Important. I think at the moment it's very difficult. It's very easy to like buy into this almost fear culture of everything's awful. The problem is going to end. We're all going to like, it's very easy to buy into that, but actually it's really important that we don't. And it's really important. So I'll say to a member of my team, you might not be aware, but if every time you walk into the office, you look really miserable at the weight of your world's on your shoulders. You're changing that, you're changing that whole vibe, and you're changing the start of the day. I'm not saying you can't be unhappy, I'm not saying you have to be false, but actually, if it's just because you can't bother to say good morning and smile, make the effort. You know, and I think mm -hmm. we've got a responsibility to make the effort with each other. Um, because everybody, every single person at any one time could probably list, you know, something that's wrong with them physically, something that's wrong with them emotionally, something that's upset them, something that's stressed them out. But equally, how about turning that head, turning that on its head and thinking there's equally stuff where you can feel good about, stuff that's really good that's happening to you, you know, your arms aren't hanging off. Like, I think it's about balancing out the human need to be negative, but actually, if we can be positive and have more of an open and positive outlook, the negative stuff can get squashed. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about someone's going through something particularly challenging in their personal life, that's, that's different, but I mean day-to-day -day interaction. So I think it's important actually that everyone understands that they actually do, it can affect teams more than they realise. Um, mm -hmm. When people realise that, they're probably quite embarrassed when they self-reflect, but they do change, and I think then that helps. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's not easy to, you know, always be on, like on, being really conscious of how you're affecting people, but when you do, it just makes a huge difference. And, um, and also taking that on board as the person that's leading, but I need to be aware that if I'm frustrated and I'm snappy, something, a small snappy comment from me, which I don't mean, 
could actually make someone really worry about their jobs, give them anxiety, make them feel really over anxious. So it's not just about, it's about everybody on the team. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and me, if I do say something which is a bit sorry to prevent, oh, ignore me, I've just come off a difficult call, you know, I'll come back to you when I've had time to process. Like, so I think yeah. it's everybody understanding that they can have an impact. Yeah, definitely being more reflective too. And just, yeah, understanding that, like you said, if you're coming up a stressful call or something, just taking time to step back and and give yourself I time. There's negative, negative yeah, and, you know, pressing pause on when an email conversation has got to a stage where you're feeling irritated, stop that email exchange and pick the phone up. You know, mm -hmm. actually, too much, too many exchanges happen where the tone has shifted slightly. You know, you can really feel that that's the attitude has changed, but people still carry on. And then it's gone from, and then it's gone into the child taking over people, and they're just angry and they're frustrated. When actually, if they press pause before, you know, you can have a, you can have a much easier conversation. So mm -hmm. um, I think that self awareness and that and that ownership of our own actions. So if we behave in a certain way, we are going to get that result. So I think making giving people that kind of control over their own destiny, I think, helps people make better choices on how they react to things. Yeah, definitely, one hundred percent. Um, thank you, um, Margarita. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just going to mute you because I hear an echo, and I think it's coming from your computer. <laughs> um, so, Jenny, my next question um, for you is: If you could go back in time to when you first started Nutcracker, um, what advice would you give yourself? Or, I guess this advice could go for anybody who's in a new leadership role, or just for leaders in general. So I think that, that's quite an easy one for me because one of the biggest, biggest mistakes I made was I didn't want to have, I think like all of us, we put off difficult conversations. You, you can feel the heat coming, you know it's coming, you know it's a problem, but actually you don't want to run the risk of demotivating that person. That person could be very defensive and very bad at taking feedback and you know it's going to be confrontational, so actually you put it off. And I've learned the, by making mistakes that... It doesn't matter how difficult the conversation, the second second it's there, have it, because it's only going to get worse. And the other thing I've learned, and I wish I knew when I started, is before 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 you become an employer and you're an employee, you know, everything is but focused around how do you keep your employees, how do you make them happy? What it's all about the employee. Whereas there's not a lot of thought that goes into how do you respect the employer, what do you give back to the employer, what does what does that look like as a two-way relationship? And one thing that I had to learn was that when I started, I was almost, because I'd seen so many poor bosses and so many poor managers, I wanted to be perfect. And I took that perfect by being too much the other way, where it needed more boundaries and not everyone could be perfect and not everyone could feel amazing all the time. So I had to learn that actually to be a really, really good leader, I needed to be able to give difficult feedback as soon as it was needed and pull people's behavior up as soon as it was needed as well as being very quick to say well done and actually that balance is really important and I also learned that if I had a bad vibe about somebody when they joined and I just thought this is not going to work when I ignored it it then became a very difficult process to get them to exit exit the organization whereas what I've learned now is to nip it in the bud straight away and say I'm really sorry this isn't going to work and mm -hmm. it's not easy to have that conversation but if it isn't going to work then you just need to deal with it no matter how difficult it is um, and that's what I'll go back and tell myself in the beginning have much stronger boundaries about what you want and feel able to communicate that but also if someone's behaving in a way which does not meet your criteria of what your culture and everything looks like then you have to be able to say it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you hire, when you're hiring them, do you, you, this might be an obvious question, but I mean, when you're hiring somebody, do you hire based on their experience or more focus on the culture and how good of a fit they might be and hope that they can just grow into the role with that? It's 100% culture and attitude, um, 100%. Um, yeah. You know, I'm quite, quite lucky in the sense that, you know, I've been in people facing jobs all of my career. So I've got, you know, I've got a very developed sense of kind of picking up people's personality what makes them tick I've managed lots of different personality styles you know and I don't think that you should recruit for one person I think you should recruit for lots of different ones but still suit a culture so mm -hmm. at Nutcracker you know it is quite a quirky place I do encourage individuality I do I do encourage ideas I do want people that think outside the box it doesn't mean they've all got to be electric light shows some of them are shy some of them are more thoughtful but it does mean they've got to be willing to have opinions be different 
um, if you had someone that walked in and was quite close minded to that, they wouldn't be happy, they wouldn't thrive and they wouldn't do very well at their jobs because they would find it all too much. It would be too intimidating to they wouldn't want to put them. They would just be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, culture is more important because I think you can teach experience. You can't teach attitude. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. That's like I, I resonate with that a lot because when I first started the happiness index, I had no experience and and working in an office space. I was in a greenhouse before. You know, but I, I, I did go the other way. I did go the other way. I got badly burnt and I thought I want attitude, attitude, attitude. And then you've got to be careful because actually you need experience to, to, to balance it out. So yeah. like anything, it's a finely tuned process. You know, it's not easy. It's not straightforward. Mm-hmm. And as everyone on this call knows, talent is the hardest thing to get right. Um, but um, you're more likely to get it right if you're clear, you're very clearly defined about your expectations, what you, what it looks like to be right, than if you are just trying to people please or not really clear or not really sure or you've got a mix mm-hmm. match. So I think some organisations have to hold their hands up and say, actually, we haven't really defined what our culture is and people don't know what our culture is. So how do they know if they fit in? And I think so I think it's important that you're really clear about what what Nutcracker is or whatever the organisation is. This is what it is. And do you mm-hmm. think actually part of it so I'm pretty direct in interviews because I'm pretty direct to the person so yeah. there's no point there's no point pretending to be something else and then they join and they're like well that's a completely different person <laughs> you know because mm-hmm. uh, I think an interview should be very transparent about what's on the table and what what the job is because I think you're much more likely to have a happier pairing I, I want to go back to your point about uh, you said talent is hard to get right I, what do you mean by that so I mean talent's hard to get right from the sense of you know when you have when you're creating a particular role you not only need a particular skill set but you need a particular type of person you need a particular type of work community you know it's all different checkers you need someone that understands they've got to be on time you need someone that understands they can't just take a day off sick because they've got period pains or because their boyfriend's upset them or because their girlfriend's upset them or because of, you know whatever you need someone to understand that they've got to be present um so there's so many different aspects of that and with nutcracker yeah, we do do things to a really, really, really high standard. So what's good at another organisation might be mediocre at Nutcracker. And that, so that's that's quite difficult because, you know, you could have someone that joins who's been told they're wonderful, they're wonderful, they're wonderful. But actually, it's half of what Nutcracker would do in that situation. So I think, you know, it's hard to find people that understand that they can be self-reflective, they can be self-critical, that what their idea of good is isn't necessarily the organisation's idea of good right now. Not to say they can't be good, but they need to see some stepping stones to get to the level of where you need them to get to. And I think ticking all the boxes of talent is hard. I also then think you've then got to keep them. <laughs> you've then got to make sure that you've got career paths, you can motivate them, they've got some of them to grow. You know, you have to balance out people's needs to get pay rises and get promotions when they're young because they need it, they need the money, with you can't give everything away you're not going to have a sustainable business so i think it's it's a hard balance to get right mm-hmm. um you know and finding good talent is hard it's hard yeah definitely thank you for that um now i just wanted to let open the floor for anybody else to ask questions if you have any for jenny or just um share any other kind of insights on how you've created a thriving culture Fiorenza, yeah go ahead i just had a quick question for jenny um how or actually what tips would you give to your team um, if they happen to be working with a client that has a very different culture to yours or even um, a conflicted a conflicted um, or yeah or even if you have a conflict in, in values or mission uh, for I mean, organizations you know it happens a lot because not crackers part unusual in the sense that I'm very um, I'm very I'm very aware of people's feelings, whereas a lot of companies aren't. Um, so it does happen quite a lot where um, my, my team are very much driven by success, by actually doing a good job. You know, that's, that's a really important to them. that They feel that sense of personal satisfaction that they are doing well. If you are doing a really good job, but you work with someone who never says well done, who only ever responds to an email if it's to criticise, who, you know, is the first to pick up on any minor thing, even though you could have had 2,000 that were perfect, that's very difficult to then keep that person motivated to want to work with that company. But then I think it's about educating them and explaining that that person's actually really insecure or because they actually can't give feedback, they haven't been taught how to give feedback, it doesn't reflect on them. And I think it's it's about making sure that you have 
you explain that it's not a personal attack on them it's just a very different way of communicating so i think it's about not hiding the fact that that culture is difficult is different and that person may well make them feel terrible may well make them feel they've done a bad job but actually it's about them having the confidence to understand that they haven't and that what what and, that, and I guess part of that is having measurable KPIs in place, measurable ideas of what success looks like. So you've got something factual to base it on rather than just kind of emotive going, well, you're great, you're great. You can say, well, factually, this was the brief. This is what you've achieved. This is what you've delivered. Therefore, it's excellent work. You don't need someone to validate that. And I'm validating it. it's brilliant. So I think it's about dissecting what is difficult. I think sometimes people are difficult to work with and you can't have a utopia where everyone's easy. And sometimes I just say to my team, some people are difficult, you know, you have to work with difficult people, but this is good for you because it will help you expand how you communicate, how you adapt, and it will help you grow as a person because not everyone is gonna be nice. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's it's about really just not dismissing it and saying, I'll oh, just get on with it for goodness sake, it's just part of life and saying, okay, this is starting to really grate on your nerves. If it's got to a stage where someone is rude, then I will deal with it directly and say, look, this is an awkward conversation to have, but you know, this isn't very con conductive. Do you not like that person? Is there a problem for work? Is there a pro what's the problem? They're going, oh, I had no idea or, you know, or yes, or whatever it might be. And then you can deal with it directly with them. And then you can either facilitate it to get better. You can change the dynamics around. But I think either way, you have to actually address it and get to what the problem is. Because there's, there can be a clashing culture, which is just, you know, some people play creative ideas over pool tables and other people think that's a complete ridiculous idea. That's that's fine. That's easy. Or there can be a clash of culture where it boils down to respect how we communicate. And I think that's harder to overcome than something where, you know, we have clients where, you know, you be like, how are you doing? Oh, yeah, I'm just just wandering around the golf course and they're going, what? Oh, oh. You know, we're all working our backsides. I can't imagine that is working. But, you know, that's that's easy because you kind of just feel a bit jealous and think, well, that's quite you know handy. Whereas if someone's rude, then that's much much harder to navigate. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Jenny. Pleasure. Um, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, Jenny, is is your culture something that you have? described as in you know it's documented there's a statement there's a there's something that describes the culture or is it just it, it's so well embedded that everybody just knows what it is and if someone was to come in and ask people you know just ad hoc please describe the culture at Nutcracker would people just automatically be able to say off the top of the head this is our culture or is it something that you've had to sort of write down I think I think it is embedded. But I think it's a really good point. And I think I will write it down after you said that. Um, I think it is embedded, but I think with Nutcracker, I had three kind of key when I before I started Nutcracker, I um, wrote down my three goals, um, and the first one was to align sales and marketing. The second was to create a culture where people thrived, felt valued, and enjoyed it, and the third was to get commercial results so what was interesting was that at the start of my journey the second part of my business plan was about people and culture so I suppose I'm quite unusual in the sense that most people wouldn't factor that into their business plan whereas obviously it was really important to me yeah. and because it is important to me Nutcracker had tremendous fast growth particularly in the first three years where it was you know it was shortlisted to be um, New Business of the Year for the National Business Awards. Like, it was tremendous growth. And I could have carried on at that tremendous growth. But what was important to me was that I did it in a sustainable, solid way and I got the right people in. So it'd be more challenging to have it embedded without it being written down if you were growing at a rate of knots and you had always yeah. have a clue. Whereas for me, I've taken the time to really onboard on people properly, really explain to them. And I think it's also just seeing how people interact, how people treat each other. It's a very much a cultural thing. But now you've said that, I think I will make a document because I think it's really important to document it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, anybody else, any final questions, comments, concerns? Well, go on, I want another question. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, I have one for you. Okay. What makes you happy? That's my final question. Okay. So. Um, I think that's quite hard to find, isn't it? For me, happiness is more of my, how my perception is. So I think our perception can really change how we see situations. 
So if my perception is really strong, then I perceive things to be really good. If my perception is off, then I find things really difficult. So, I mean, basic happiness is things like, you know, if I'm managing my life and my children are happy, my work's going well, like I'm actually managing to sleep, I might be exercising, you know, that'd be ticking a lot of boxes. I mean, that might be a bit ambitious. Um, but um, for me, it's my perception. And when I'm solid in my mind and I'm really strong mentally, then I'm pretty upbeat as a person. It's only if I allow doubt or fear or I start to see things, that's when I start to feel unhappy because I feel out of control. I feel like I can't control my destiny and that's when I start to feel unhappy. Oh, that's a really good answer. I haven't, I haven't heard something like that before. I like that. Maybe I'm just a weirdo. <laughs> I've got a question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, Jenny, how many people in the Nutcracker Agency? So there's 10 of us, but including yeah. um, other people like who contribute to, during the course of the month, it's more like a team of 15, 20 that I would have you know, real engagement with. So it's probably about 20. But in terms of kind of actually office base, so to speak, it's 10. But that would be grossly, if, if the rest of the other 10 were listening, they would be very devastated. So it's, it's firmly, you know, oh, God, I should just say 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Can we rewind that recording and just say that answer? <laughs> Rosie can kind of get out. Yeah. <laughs> um, with regards to culture, um, you as the founder, you shaped the culture. But how do you think culture develops or evolves as the company gets bigger? So I think I think it evolves by different personalities bringing different skill sets to it and different ways of working. I think different ages, different dem different demographics, different backgrounds shape culture. Um, I think for me, the, cult the average age at Nutcracker has changed by a decade in a couple of years. So that's been a huge shift because that has been a massive change and that has brought in a different culture. Um, but I think for me, the founding um, pillars of, my, of the culture, if you like, in terms of how people communicate, respect, non-toxicity, um, reasonable workloads, if people don't feel less flogged to death. There's certain things which are just earmarked, but there's other things which are just fluid because it doesn't have to be about what I want. It has to be about what a whole team wants as a culture. Um, but obviously, there's deal breakers for me. So I think it, I think it, I think it evolves and it changes dependent on the team. And you can have people that really affect the culture negatively. We had someone that worked at Nutcracker didn't didn't work there very long, but she was an extremely toxic individual. And you didn't see it at first because it's wrapped up in a very sweet package. But actually, the toxic stuff just started to go, you know, it just started to be spread. And it was very, very, very difficult to see. And because I am the CEO, I don't, I, it's very nice to me. So it's only when I started to observe, I thought, oh, what's going on here? Everyone's so miserable. How did this happen so quickly? <laughs> you know, and so I think, um, I feel like I've been a bit long-winded in my answer, but I, so I think it does evolve and change depending on who's on the team. But, you know, I've managed bigger team. I mean, it's difficult because obviously it's my own business, so my workload is far greater than I manage far bigger teams because the buck stops with me and it's my business. But I think in some ways it's, it's, almost, it's almost more warts and all when you're really involved in managing a smaller team because you're really, like, rolling your sleeves up and getting involved. Whereas when you're managing managers to manage people, Okay, it might not be as thorough, but sometimes it's not. It's not as yeah. You're not so. You're not so emotionally attached. It's easier to to manage if that makes sense. Totally. Cool. So. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, I'm gonna shut it down for the day. But thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Jenny. That was really really great. Um, I'll share on the recording with everybody so you can. Everyone enjoyed it. That was useful. No, it was great. I, I learned a lot from you. So thank you very much. Um, we'll send around a follow up to everybody um, with the recording and details for our next episode. But um, hopefully to see you all again next week or not no, next week, in two weeks, bi-weekly now. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a good Bye.